Celebrity has launched the campaign to try and counter the extremists. Now speaking out to denounce terror and extremism. 30,000 people formed a human chain in the South this afternoon in the name of peace. We're asking if religious intolerance is on the rise. We believe that religious freedom is a fundamental human right. Giving a message that Islam is a religion of peace. We must all endeavor to spread love and a sense of community. In the name of God, the gracious, the merciful, may the peace and open blessings of Almighty God be upon you. Welcome to this, the sixth episode of Press Point. Today, we're talking about World War III, and we're asking the simple question of, is the world facing a global catastrophe in terms of a nuclear thermal war, in terms of World War III, and we're looking at three different issues. Firstly, the issue of economic instability around the world. Secondly, injustice around the world and thirdly the issue of the rise of terror for each of these we're going back to the central point of do these do these matters lead us towards the third world war we're very lucky i'm joined in the studio by my good friend farouk mahmoud alaikum salam of course it's a very serious topic isn't it uh, we want to hear the views of a real uh, very important guests around the world, of course, all the viewers around the world to, to share with us their ideas, what they think about this important topic. Is really something serious? The world war is looming. If it is the case, then do write to us, send us emails at presspoint.mt.tv, or you can send us your tweets as, at presspointmta. Also, you want to take the Facebook route, write to facebook.com forward slash presspointmta. We're waiting for you to share with us your ideas and we'll share with the worldwide empty audience. Now, brother, we're very blessed as well because in the studio we have two very special guests. On my immediate left, we have Iftikhar Yaz, Saeb Thank OBE. Uh, Iftikhar, of course, has worked with the UN and the UNDP as well as the ambassador to the Tuvalu Islands. Salam alaikum, Iftikhar Saeb. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. So, Thanks for inviting me. It's uh -huh. an honor and privilege. Pleasure. Thank you. Kadus Malik Saib is also with us in the studio. He is a U.S. A human rights lawyer. He's come all the way from the U.S. and we're very grateful. Salam alaikum. Malikum Islam, thanks for having me. Exactly. Now, Farouk, we know that the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has recently talked on this issue of World War III. So that's what we're going to start off with. We're going to take a look at a video of the Khalifa of Islam giving the guidance to the world in relation to the threat of World War III. Let's go to the video now. If we look at Europe's own financial crisis and its long-term effects, we see that it is causing restlessness to spread within Europe's population. And this anxiety is increasing at great speed. If not handled properly, the results of such frustrations and dis desperation will prove to be catastrophic. The America-Japan alliance is such that if a war between China and Japan were to take place, the United States would actively side with Japan. Today, a major tactic used to try and harm enemy nations is to target their trade and business interests. The world today is not the same world it was 50 or 60 years ago. Even back then, the acts of one nation's, uh, nation affected others. However, today it is at a completely different level. As the world has become extremely closely knit and interdependent, China is emerging as an ever-growing progressive economic might and is expect, uh, expected to become the largest in the coming years. Its economic might is so strong that commentators have said that its power is causing great concern to the United States. Indeed, it is being rightly said that the United States will seek to halt China's economic progress and will leave no stone unturned in this effort. Given this, it is possible that China will be somewhat cautious and show restraint in its dispute with Japan, but there are no guarantees to this. Perhaps because of foreseeing and considering uh, 
America's attitude and policy and its ultimate possible effect on other Western countries, China has started exploring new markets. As in recent years, we see that China has invested a great deal in Africa and the developing countries. So its economic interest in that part of the world are widespread and deeply ingrained. So Farouk, I believe you've been taking a look online to give us some online information, some research about the economic crisis. What have, what have you got? I've first of all got the, uh, one of the um, uh, news here on, on uh, Huffington Post newspaper. It talks about G uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, the Luxembourg Prime Minister, warns European war demons may return. Hazul mentioned that actually in his speech. He said uh, this gentleman has talked about First World War being very similar, the circumstances before that, to the time now. And has all said, in his view, that this, it's far worse than that. Even it looks very much similar to the Second World War and preceding that, the circumstances were quite uh, difficult for the world to, to carry on like that. This gentleman here, Mr. Luxembourg's Prime Minister, Mr. Juncker, says that anyone who believes that the eternal issue of war and peace in Europe has been permanently laid to rest could be making monumental error. He further says, in 1913, many people believed that there would never again be a war in Europe. The great powers of the continent were economically so strongly intermeshed that there was the widespread opinion that they could simply no longer afford to engage in military conflicts. And then, the press TV has given an interview of uh, Paolo Raffoni, who is in fact the Secretary General of CIPA Foundation. Uh, and he said something which again is worrying and also talks about, he just links the, econo uh, the, the, the financial problems with uh, the looming war, apparently. Uh, what he's saying is this, that um, uh, the continuation of austerity measures which are being implemented apparently at least in Europe will not change much during 2013, will create more strain at social level pushing people in the street. And people are disoriented, they do not understand the hurricanes of the financial system, they just know they want to have a normal life, normal services, once they have paid taxes. Of course, further down he uh, paints much gloomier picture, which we can discuss later on. Mm. So very, very serious situation, I think. So in building on this, could you, uh, Mr. Malik, how serious is the crisis now? What's the current state of the crisis across the world here in April 2013? I think that uh, a lot of people are saying that we are, um, Europe for instance, is going back into a recession, the US has tried, and it seems like all these countries have tried various methods to try and get out of this slump, and um, unfortunately it hasn't been working the way they had hoped. So I know in the US um, there was a huge infusion of money, and, 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 and the idea was to kickstart the economy by having this, uh, 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 this quantitative easement, and, uh, but, but the, the growth as a result of it has not been what was expected. Um, Europe is similar, uh, Cyprus we all saw, um, you know, and, and, and Farouk Saab mentioned um, unrest, and, and I think that that a lot of people all over Europe are talking about the real possibility of this financial crisis not, you know, not being short term and leading to bigger and graver concerns. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we know un unemployment has risen hugely. So, coming to yourself, Mr. Yars, how does this crisis, economic crisis, relate to war, and just how seriously does it take us towards another potential world war? I think the worst uh, crisis that. Uh, can be a threat to war is the economic uh, imbalance and disparities. And we see throughout the history of the world that uh, economic uh, disparities have always uh, affected uh, peace and harmony in the societies and nations. We find that uh, the main cause of the First World War was the emergence of Germany as a superpower in Europe and the intentions of Germany to take over the rest of Europe and the world. And the same thing happened during the Second World War as well. There was, it's not only political expansionism and imperialism, it is also economic expansionism and imperialism. And that is what you find in the world of today, that the, the greatest rivalry between the big powers is the economic rivalry. As Uzur mentioned in his address as well, the China's uh, passion for economic expansionism. They're reaching out into the corners of Africa 
and elsewhere. I mean, they've even penetrated uh, their economic interests into America and the whole of Western Europe. And uh, you can't think of a country where China's uh, trade and commerce uh, is not affecting their own economy. So the question actually, I, if Tikal's mentioned it, and I know you're from the US, I mean, this is a key point of China's increasing uh, economic dominance. To what extent is this pushing greater volatility of the US government, the mindset of the US government, in terms of actions that may take us closer to a third world war, just as Iftikhar Sahib has mentioned there? Um, I think that's a very interesting dynamic uh, between China and the US. And recently, uh, this was a couple of years ago, um, I think it was in the New York Times, they talked about how during bilateral talks and meetings and financial summits, the Chinese now have started to tell the U.S. that you're doing this wrong, you need to do it this way. And the U.S. is not used to being told how to do certain things, but it's just the, the power shift and the imbalance that's been created. You know, China is, 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 is a huge economy. It's, it's the, you know, the U.S. is struggling to grow at, you know, maybe 1.5 percent per year, whereas China is growing at 9 percent every year, and, 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 and they have bought a lot of the, uh, the Treasury bonds. So China is now in a position to dictate, and, and, and obviously nobody in the U.S. likes the fact that they have uh, now their Financially, they're so economically they've become so weak um, uh, that they, that the country like China that they were so dismissive of until 10 years ago mm. is now in a position to 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 dictate terms. Um, and obviously, they wouldn't say that outright, but but it is a concern that's that's obviously developing. So, Kalusa, well, how do you find the similarities between the times before the First World War and the Second World War, the days we are going through now? I think that there are a lot of similarities, and, 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 and there are people like Ben Bernanke and, and a lot of the, there, there are economic similarities, there are political similarities, there, the, there's an ideological threat. So if you look at all these different variables uh, that led to uh, conflicts in the past, major wars, a lot of those variables are, we see them now on the horizons, and, and, and they're really a serious concern. Uh, so for instance, I mean, you can focus on any, any one of them, but you know, currency wars is, uh, is, is one way. I mean, they, in, in the Second World War before, in the interwar period, there was this sense of Germany being undone by the, the, by the treaty and, and, and feeling that they were not treated justly. And uh, a lot of these, England was one of them, they had to, uh, give up the gold standard and, 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 and they went to a way to devalue their currency so that they can be more competitive and that led other countries to do that. So that's something very similar that we're seeing today. I mean, Japan uh, and the U.S. or um, uh, the U some people say that quantitative easement was a way for the U.S. to, to it's, a, it's an aspect of currency war. So there are a lot of different um, uh, elements that are, uh, that you can find. And if you look deeply, you will find that they're, they're parallel. And Hazur mentioned it in his, um, in, in the, in the peace symposium address as well. Yes. Also, we actually were lucky enough to have interviewed uh, your countryman, of course, um, uh, Gerald Salenti, who's a, a leading uh, forecaster of uh, the trends in the world. Uh, he spoke to us at length and he painted a picture I think was, was quite uh, grim. So let's have a look what he said. Right, we're joined here by Gerald Salenti, the publisher of the Trends Journal and director of the Trends Research Institute. He's an American trend forecaster who makes forecasts about the global financial markets and other events of historical importance. We welcome you on the show, Mr. Salenti. Well, thank you for Ruth. Right, three or four years ago you had said uh, Wall Street controls our financial lives, the media manipulates our minds. To some it might sound a bit radical of a statement, uh, but in the light of the recent um, performance of uh, stock markets, for example, uh, it seems like that, you know, they're, they're doing pretty fine. Uh, the records, we've seen record highs in the stock market. Unemployment in America has gone down to 7.2 percent. Uh, they're saying recession is over, at least in the U.S. Uh, things seem to be improving generally. Do you think the recovery is real? No, I don't. Uh, when you look at the jobs that were lost since the Great Recession began in 2008, they were mostly middle wage income jobs. That's mm. a fact. The other fact is that the jobs that have been created since are mostly low paying jobs. Mm. The other fact is the numbers that you just mentioned, for example, last month. Yes, they created some 88,000 jobs, 
but also nearly a half a million people fell out of the workforce. Right. And once you are out of the workforce and you're no longer looking for jobs, in the United States, you're no longer counted as unemployed. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, so, so we see contrasting we see contrasting approaches to resolve uh, these economic problems. Now, there are huge austerity measures in place in the UK by the coalition government. On the other hand, we see that in the US um, they're printing loads of money to jumpstart the economy. Which approach, in your view, is better? I mean, quantitative easing or austerity? <laughs> oh, what's worse, a uh, a bullet in the heart or a uh, or hanging? So what do you do then? So that's, that's the two choices. Uh, it, and on one hand, then you look at the quantitative easing. All that is a debate, is a, is, is, is a debasement of our currency. And what they're mm. doing is they're taking our money, just like in Europe with the austerity measures, and giving it to the banks. They're giving our future to the banks. Mm. Where do you think this quantitative easing is going? It's going into the bankers' pockets. No, so, so that's a predicament now, isn't it? So you, you're saying both are wrong then. So, so what do we do? Well, what you do is you go back to when did it work before? What's the measurement you could start with? Mm. So when you look at the United States, it's quite simple. After the crash of 1929 and the Great Depression ensued, they put in place the Glass-Steagall Act which prevented the banks from becoming the criminal operations that they've now become. But that, of course, was deregulated, on the beginning under Bill Clinton in earnest, and then kept becoming worse and worse. So you put those things back in place that worked before. We used to have trade agreements that used to allow people in this country to earn a, a living wage. Mm -hmm. But no, they've, they've taken not only our manufacturing and put it offshore, Along with it, they sold our technology, our brain power. So you have to go back to the way things worked before. So quite clearly, this is not just the Omidy Muslim community, but this is leading experts really seriously fearing a third world war as a result of the economic crisis. In light of this threat, uh, Mr. Yars, what can be done to end this crisis, avert the crisis, and also essentially avert the potential risk of third world war? Well, the fact is, and uh, all these big powers are, are admitting now that they are in recession, and Britain is fearing uh, the third dip in recession, and uh, the situation with America is not worse. But what aggravates this situation are the national ambitions. America does not want to budge from the position that it is the master of the world and uh, the supreme power in the world. Instead of understanding the tactics of economy and learning from uh, China, which is now the best economy in the world at the moment, they are going on a path of confrontation and rivalry. But Islam, as uh, Hazrat Amir Muminin, the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, very, very clearly mentioned in his address on the 23rd of March, that if they really want to get out of this, they have to appreciate that there are four pillars on which harmony and uh, coordination and uh, consultation and cooperation can be based. And he said that according to Islam, those through uh, those four pillars are peace, tolerance, justice, and compassion. He said, if these big powers will have those four basic values, then they will be able to get onto the path of real justice and integrity, and also be faithful to the truth. That is not try to hide the truth because of protecting their uh, nationalism and because of protecting their national ambitions. So I think uh, the uh, Khalifa of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, was very, very clear in showing the world the path forward in order to get out of this crisis and get onto the path of real peace and prosperity. So I guess this is the, the central path that we know, four central principles given to us by the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. 
to what extent is the world actually managing to fulfil this? International governance, um, as well as financial institutions, how well are they actually managing to implement this guidance? I, it seems like they're not managing it well at all. Um, if you just look at the, the financial crisis, I mean, the, bank, the, the governor of the Bank of England, and this is just one example of many, he has repeatedly said that there are some serious systemic flaws that we have not even begun to address. And this crisis started in 2008. So this is five years later, and somebody with the prestige and with you know, somebody who's the, the, the leading uh, uh, policymaker for the UK has, has said this. IMF uh, stability report just last week in, 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 the, in New York, they talked about it. And the head of the IMF said that all of these issues, I mean, these are very, very short-sighted uh, band-aids that we are trying to put on the situation. And, and I, you know, it seems like they don't even understand what, what the real core of the issue is. And, and how can you begin to address that until you have had that conversation? And the reason that conversation isn't happening is because the people are not that decision-making that requires, as, as Hazrat Khalifa Masih has said, and as Ayaz Saab was pointing out, um, that, that people are being driven by their vested interests. Mm -hmm. if, you are the, if you are the head of uh, a, a large financial institution, you, you may not necessarily be concerned about what happens to the masses or what happens to the economy as long as you are getting your bonuses. Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing that we all can tell, that the bonuses have not gone down on Wall Street or yes. in the UK. Everything so else has. I think, I think if I understand the points correctly, for example, it's essentially a choice of confrontational cooperation. What's, what have we been getting online from yeah, our Russia tweets? Views are very Is it reflecting the topic this? And they've been sending in all these emails and tweets quite regularly, every other second is email or tweet coming through. Uh, let me just read two of them. Uh, Tahmina R says, the main factors disrupting peace are greed of wealth and power, intolerance and the growing lack of spirituality, she says. And also we've got um, Afzi uh, who says, restlessness, grudge, money, intolerance, negligence to God's existence, are a fraction of factors disrupting world peace today. And also looking at some top, top economists of the world who have actually uh, given some advice regarding the forecast of war linked with uh, the global unrest uh, in, in uh, the economic situation. Uh, let me just read a few of those by Kyle Bass, which is uh, mentioned on Washington blog. Um, he says that um, uh, all too often war is the manifestation of simple economic entropy played to its logical conclusion. We believe that war is an inevitable consequence of the current global economic situation. Larry Edelson says that I'm certainly not the first person to examine these very distinctive patterns in history. There have been many before me, notably Raymond Wheeler, who published the most authoritative chronicle of war ever, covering a period of 2,600 years of, of data. However, there are very few people, he says, who are willing to even discuss the issue right now. And based on what I'm seeing, the implications could be absolutely huge in 2013. And then uh, Nouriel Roubini, in fact, um, another uh, researcher and, and an economist in America, uh, was brought up in, in Turkey. And, and he says that um, um, in, in the 1930s, uh, because we made a major policy mistake, we went through financial instability, defaults, currency devaluations, printing money, capital controls, trade wars, populism, a bunch of radically says populist aggressive regimes coming to power from Germany to Italy to Spain to Japan, and then we ended up with World War II. Now, I'm not predicting, he says, World War III, but seriously, if there, there was a global financial crisis after the first one, then we go into depression. The political and social instability in Europe and other advanced economies is going to be, become extremely severe. And lastly, for the time being, a uh, billionaire investor, Jim Rogers, says, a continuation of bailouts in Europe could ultimately spark another world war. He further says, add debt, the situation gets worse, and eventually it just collapses. Then everybody is looking for uh, scapegoats, politicians blame foreigners, and we are in the world war two or world war whatever, he says. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting that our online tweets, our international economic experts, as well as that of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, are almost in consensus that mm. if we continue on this path, there is really only one logical conclusion, which is a reproduction of world war, which is a truly terrifying prospect, I think. You, 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 yes. you, you find that you know, after the political ambitions to prove to the world that a certain country is the best and the most powerful, now the tendency has been during the last decade to 
to, to be recognized as uh, a supreme power through economic uh, uh, advancement and all that. And you find that this is what has been happening in uh, Europe as well. Germany has been trying to uh, show itself as the supreme economic power in the European Union zone. And therefore, the uh, smaller countries, you know, like Greece, Italy, uh, Spain, Portugal, etc., they have been uh, really squeezed because they have been actually supporting the economies, the big economies, at the cost of losing their own economic base. And this was the situation even uh, before uh, the Second uh, World War when Hitler invaded Russia. And what did he go there for? Plundering their oil fields and uh, their other economic assets. And this is what you find, the track record of the recent uh, wars in the Gulf and elsewhere as well. The main factor, the main motive in those wars was the economic gains. And uh, if this trend does not stop right now, then obviously the path which the world is following is the path of the Third World War and destruction. Mm. Well, this is exactly where we want to take it on our second section, which is that of injustice, because I think, in fact, just as Mr. Yaz is saying, it's, it's not just a monetary issue, but it's, it's value-based. It's about the principles which you are willing to practice or unwilling to practice. Yes. And so the, the, the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community talked about this issue as well at the recent peace symposium, from the 2013 peace symposium, and he really emphasized this issue of justice and injustice spreading across the world. Let's take a look at that now. Another major cause of TV and is internal power struggles within countries and then in many nations the rights due to members of the public are being unjustly usurped. Another factor is that some parties seek to demonstrate their power and might by treating others extremely cruelly. Further, a root cause of division is a lack of justice in the world. This is leading directly to a complete lack of mutual confidence and trust. Another cause of unrest is the fact that people or governments look at the wealth and resources of others with a sense of, sense of envy and greed. In fact, they do not limit themselves to the envious classes, but actually seek to seize what is not rightly, uh, rightfully theirs. As I said, there's a long list of reasons by the world, uh, why the world is being consumed by hatred and disorder. And I have only mentioned a few. These issues are of grave concern, and we must reflect over how to solve them so we can seek to establish global peace. Just a few months after last year's peace symposium, I traveled to the United States and was invited to address members of Congress at Capitol Hill. Apart from the politicians, a number of important think tanks and academics were also in attendance. In my address to them, I said that as the world's biggest superpower, the United States had to consider its responsibilities to the wider world. I said that if they fail to fulfill their obligations, and if they fail to observe the proper standards of justice, then the, they would lead the world towards a terrifying destruction. I said that the coming generations would lay the blame at the feet of us, and in particular, the major powers of this time. Our children or grandchildren would not forgive us because they would know that we could have prevented the harrowing legacy that we left behind for them. Amongst all of this, there is only one hope, 
and one guarantee of peace, and that is for justice to prevail in the same spirit that the Holy Prophet وسلم, has taught, that you prefer for others what you prefer for yourself. If such justice can develop where, where each country and each great power prefer for others what it prefers for itself, then we can still find peace. Mr. Yaz, the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has made very clear that a massive problem here in relation to World War III is a complete absence of justice in so much of the international relations which are taking place at the moment. Can I go to you and say, what is the current state of global injustice around the world and to what extent are we managing to fulfill the principles of justice in international relations? Well, I think if we soberly analyze the present scenario and situation of the world, the major and most important ingredient that is missing is justice. And Huzur very passionately has been drawing the attention of the world to this failure. He addressed uh, the Capitol Hill, he addressed the European Union, and now more recently, as just as we have heard, he addressed uh, again the Peace Symposium in London on the 23rd of March. And he's again drawing the attention of the world to this very, very important responsibility. And he has said that there are two important factors without which the countries cannot uh, maintain or sustain justice. And they are integrity and faithful to the truth. They have to be absolutely truthful in everything that they do. And they have to show that uh, they have a status, a good understanding of integrity. And integrity means that you do not have a double standard. You deal with one country in one way and you deal with another country in another way. As you find that there are several conflicts in the world today where such a practice is going on, they are being treated you know, very differently by the big powers because the big powers treat one country where they have their interest in a different way differently and another country in a different way. For example, That's a very good point, for example, the big issue, you know, about uh, North Korea turning nuclear. Now, there are so many other countries. For example, has uh, America or any other power ever questioned the nuclear status of Israel? And uh, this is actually a point which I think is, Mr. Yassab has drawn us right to the crux of it, which essentially you've mentioned integrity, faithfulness to the truth. And apologies to, to cut you off there, Mr. Yassab, but in particular, I mean, Mr. Mr. Malik, drawing on what Mr. Yassab has, has mentioned here, to what extent, for example, in let's take an example of the Korea situation, a lot of people are talking about Korea at the moment. To what extent is the root cause of this problem just what Mr. Yassab has mentioned here, an absence of injustice? Would you say? Absolutely. And I think that the, 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 whether it's the North Korea issue, South Korea issue, whether it's the issue in Syria, and, and I think that it, and, and another point that I think that Hazur has made repeatedly is that, that when we sometimes we tend to focus on the injustices that we are suffering. So North Korea may come to you and say that, well, this is an injustice that we are not being allowed to make a, a nuclear weapon because X, Y, and Z have it. Uh, but I think Hassab has been very careful in drawing your attention to and using Quranic teaching and the teachings of Islam that justice is a two-way stream and and if you're not so if the dynasty of King Kim Jong-il and and Kim, Kim Jong-un are not ju treating North Koreans justly that also leads to a, 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 a wider problem that we are facing today the before I was uh, leaving for the US uh, for the UK uh, on the airport CNN had a screenshot saying that Intel sources you know uh, North Korea at the brink of launching a nuclear strike so, so that is, and, and that is, is, is a threat that is so real, and, and those missiles can reach all the way to the U.S., and, and part of it is that I think that the U.S. and North Koreans, they need to evaluate whether this is power politics or this is based on justice, what are the needs of the North Koreans that can be met without giving them handouts that, that, that you show on TV in the U.S. and saying that we are feeding these people who are hungry, and it's very humiliating and demeaning. So you need to build 
build self-respect. It's about building of self-respect and I guess returning to these core principles which have been mentioned. Now we have one of your brothers from your home country back in the US online now on Skype. So Mr Amjad Khan, we've heard from Mr Malik and Mr Yaz that essentially this is a, again an issue of values and principles being played out very badly on the international arena. Let me ask you, in, in light of your experience, of course you are a, a US attorney uh, working again in the areas of international law and human rights. To what extent, what are the root causes of these global injustices which are taking place all around the world? In your eyes, what's going right to the core? What's, what's happening here? Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> what's happening here is, as was discussed, there are two principles of governance um, in Islam, amanat, trust, and adil, justice. And both principles are being violated by many nations in the world. Really, there's, uh, nations are betraying their contractual commitments, their trade commitments, various treaties. There's issues of perfidy, treachery. Um, these are what are causing the unrest and global instability. You know, th there's another really salient and important factor here as well, and that is access to justice. There is, of course, injustice as between nations, but there's also an issue of injustice within nations. And the World Justice uh, Project did a study uh, on access to justice, and the findings were quite startling. For example, the United States, which one would think would have a, a higher index, a higher score for access to justice, ranks in the bottom 20% of wealthy nations. So really there's a problem internally as well as respect to access to justice, and that affects and shapes the lack of honoring one's contractual commitments abroad. So this is a serious issue, and we see that injustice is prevailing throughout. And until and unless these two principles are adhered to, amanat and adil, truly and absolutely, we will continue to see this downward spiral. Key point. I mean, let, let's take another example. Let's say, for example, the the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has referred very heavily to the issue of the Japan-China island dispute. Practically speaking, how can we apply these principles? If I may come to yourself, uh, Mr. Yasser, yeah. because I mean, obviously, this yeah. is something which you would have had to look at in the UN and in relation to international affairs. How can these countries take heed from the the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community to help them to solve a crisis such as the Japan? Uh, China Ryan and dispute, for example. I think what's very important, the message that is coming out from uh, uh, the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is that the concept of justice is in, in Islam is very wholesome. It applies to every field of human life. It's politics, it's economics and everything. And you find that wherever it is um, undermined, you know, I mean, it's very specifically mentioned in the Holy Quran, why is kultum fadilu, that whenever, you know, you say something, you have to be very truthful and very just to it. And you find that this crisis has been going on in the inflammable triangle of uh, Korea, Japan, and uh, uh, China for, for many, many years. It's going back into even before the First World War. And uh, China's relationship, very special relationship with Korea is part of history. And these recent uh, issues, you know, which have created uh, a conflicting situation between Japan and China related to a couple of islands, which actually were owned by China in the past, you know, and because of the geographical changes on account of the uh, wars in the peninsula, they were taken over by Japan. And more recently, when, uh, because U.S. has a base in Japan and U.S. Uh, is supporting Japan as uh, an ally, and uh, the Japanese wanted to have uh, an overall possession of those islands, and they were negotiating a deal with the inhabitants of those islands, then uh, U.S. openly came out and they said, oh, if China is going to oppose this deal, we will be siding with Japan, you know, just threatening uh, a way of uh, creating a conflict which could 
end up in a more serious uh, situation. Mr. Yass, I mean, this is key, which is, which is of course, within this, this area, as you've said again, these international players, yes. in fact, failing to recognise the duties which are upon them. Yes. Building on what Mr. Yass has, has said, Mr. Malik, to what extent would, for example, a situation like this, what are the real risks of World War III spiralling from these m apparently minor situations, but potentially acting as a spark for a wider conflict? I think each one of these situations can be explosive. And, and I think if you look at the history of war, it's very, very hard to pin down. I mean, hindsight, they say, is 2020. But when, when you're going through it, if you look at the, the, the New York Times or the London Times from the day that the Second World War broke, broke out, nobody said that, oh, Second World War has broken out. Or you know, when the American Civil War in, the 18, you know, in 1860, so a lot of this is that these issues are, are, are there and they're used by countries to, to settle their scores and, and, and as we discussed earlier, the whole economic um, uh, dimension to this is playing a role. I mean, China and Japan, is Japan threatened by China's rise? Is it really about this island or is it about the underlying relationship of, and, and, and the control or the, the, the sphere of influence that Japan wants to maintain. Um, so it's very, I think that the, uh, right now, and I think Hazur has mentioned uh, a lot of these flashpoints in his peace symposium address. Uh, I think Hassab mentioned the North Korea, South Korea conflict, and it was, I, I thought it was amazing that, that uh, a week after Hazur's speech, CNN was running headlines that they're re getting ready for a nuclear strike. Uh, this time the intel may be not so accurate, but the next time it could be. And those conflicts are real. You know, this issue is another issue. Syria, um, I think a lot of people have been discussing Syria and, 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 and there's a lot of worry that because of the geopolitical uh, uh, situation that, that, that Syria is in and, 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 and the relationship with Israel and, and internally what's going on, Russia supporting it. Some people think that, that Syria is the last country where Russia still has influence in the Middle East exactly. and that's why you, you know the that domino effect that we saw starting from Tunisia all the way through mm. Libya hasn't happened in Syria right so does that does the Syria then have the potential to act as a to act as a spark. proxy war and then it sparks a greater conflict involving the US and and, yeah. and, and, and Russia I think from what from what's been said here to yourself Mr. Yars, what can the world take from this, this particular speech of the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community? I mean, I know that having talked with you about this it, previously, that in fact it is rich in terms of its guidance. It's almost like a universal manifesto, I, I think you described yeah. it as. How should the world be looking towards this guidance? Actually, uh, one point which uh, um, Malik Saab just made is very important, that world wars start from a speck of a spark. You know, the First World War started with a very minor incident. It was uh, uh, Gavrilo, you know, a Serbian, who shot the heir uh, of the uh, Austro-Hungarian regime, you know, Ferdinand. And that provoked the First World War, just this one small incident. And therefore, Huzur has been guiding that you have to be very meticulous in whatever you do. And the way to be meticulous is to follow the path of justice. If they will not follow the path of justice, they can never be able to, to justify the, the, their obligations to humanity and to the world and to peace. So therefore, the, the message of uh, the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community coming out to the world is in a way very serious that if they will not change their ways and they will continue to be conscious of their uh, uh, ambitions and uh, the competitions and the rivalries, then the path they are treading on is really a great threat and risk to the future. At this point has been very clearly mentioned earlier on in the, in the history of Ahmadiyyad by the Promised Messiah himself you know, who warned that there will be a third world war. Mm -hmm. And he did mention that. And if there will be opportunity, I will read out the Promised Messiah's extract later on. But this is a, a very, very important uh, uh, monument, a, 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 a light for the world to, to notice and to follow the guidance that is provided by the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in his varied addresses, particularly the last one on the 23rd of March. This is a very key point. I think just we're yeah. short on time, so what we might need to do is 
could bring this back in the third section. But before we do, Farouk, I know you've been taking a lot of tweets on this issue, yes. which have really been building on what the Harris team guests have a been lot telling of tweets, us. Here. Of course, we talk about justice in, in particular. Uh, 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 Sarah Flounders, in fact, she's one of the uh, ladies that she's written quite extensively about the injustice in the world, and she talks about veto power to be an issue on Iran's uh, press TV. She's interviewed and they've tr transcribed on, on, the, on the website saying that she says from the very beginning the UN Security Council has been a completely unrepresentative body and the veto gives the US enormous leverage along with Britain and France who have used it again and again and it reflects the world as it existed under colonial domination under enormous imperialist control at the end of World War II. To balance it, if you look at the the view by the, the world leader, who could compare Hazrat Amir al muminin the fifth successor of the Prophet the worldwide head of the Andalusian community, he has even talked to the Chinese, uh, Chinese Premier. He's not only just saying it's a problem at the one end, he also has written a letter to the Chinese Prime Minister, I think it's almost a year now, it was 12th of April when he sent a letter. In that letter, as we mentioned to uh, the Premier of China, you also possess the right to use a power to veto when required in the U UN. Hence, in this context, it is my request to you to play your role to save the world from the destruction that looms before us. Irrespective of nationality, religion, caste or creed, we should strive to our utmost to save humanity. Uh, look at it. I mean, this kind of balanced approach could see n nowhere else in the world. Watch the TV channels world over, from America to UK, North Korea, China. Every channel you watch has got some sort of agenda. Hazur has got one agenda, that is to, to basically implement uh, this, this justice in the world uh, as per the Holy Quran's teachings. Then again, one more thing I'd like to add to it is uh, in Hazur's speech, Hazur mentioned also Shimon Peres' uh, view regarding what should happen in Syria. And Hazur said an Mormon, a faithful, should accept all kinds of good things. Even if you see something which is uh, commendable, you should accept it. You should uh, not really resent it because it comes from an enemy. So Hazur has advised the Muslim nations to take heed to what uh, Shimon Peres has, has said about Syria. He said if the West, West arms the opposition, they can say it is a war of the West in Syria, as was talking, um, uh, Shimon Peres talked about. Uh, it's an Arab question, he says. There is an Arab League. The Arabs have armies. They have got a mandate from the UN for a transitional period of time to have elections. Let them handle it and get rid of Assad. So it's a good advice, basically. So it's basically army from the Arabs to deal with the problem in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good solution which could be taken uh, very seriously. It's Sorry. very key. I think that what's wonderful is there's a third element to this as well, which the Khalifa of Islam has also talked about, which is the rise of terror. And of course, as Muslims, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community have a very special <coughs> pardon me, interest in this. So in order to, to understand how the threat of terror links to World War III, let's go to another video of the, of the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. And let's have a look at that now. It requires all parties to give truthful and fair testimony and rather than uh, veto power for a select few. There should be true democracy and justice across the board. If these steps are taken, then we will find peace between nations and we will find that terrorist organizations will die away and lose all support. Until recently, the main terrorist groups were based in Afghanistan or Pakistan, but in the past few years, we have seen that they have also emerged in some African countries and elsewhere. But if true peace through justice prevails, then certainly the members of the general public will stand up and forcefully reject extremism, and so terrorist organizations will die of it. So let's go over to our US correspondent, to Amjad Khan, and ask what is the international overview of the rise of terror around the world? Uh, we know in particular the Khalifa of Islam has said that it's not just in Afghanistan and Pakistan, but it's now a real threat in Africa as well. What's your take on this, Amjad? Yes. Uh, Khalifa al-Masih, the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, has rightly pointed out that the threat of terrorism is a real threat. It's a global threat. It's not just simply isolated in a few Muslim countries. It's worldwide. And terrorists aren't only just Muslims as well. And really, how do you fight 
such terrorism, how do you uh, eradicate this terrorism, is that you build a just society. You fight terrorism with transparency, with trust, with accountability. Um, and, and terrorists operate outside the rule of law. And nations cannot operate outside the rule of law. So as they apprehend and, and arrest uh, terrorists, they must also try them and show to the world and to the terrorists who act with impunity that the rule of law is sacrosanct and all nations must abide by that. And significantly, testimony must be truthful. That testimony, even against your own loved ones, even your close friends, are, is important. It's important to act not just in your own self-interest, but with the principles of justice. And I think this is one avenue to fight terrorism in the world. This is really useful because this leads us directly onto the comments of uh, Mr. Salenti again. Let's go and take a listen to him. We've asked him about the risk of global terror in relation to World War III. Then we'll come back to the studio. Right, I think, let me ask you a question. There are reports that Al-Qaeda is gaining momentum outside Pakistan and Afghanistan. Mali now seems to be the primary hotspot these days, as you, as you mentioned already. Uh, what do you think are the reasons of ever so increasing circle of influence of these, uh, these terrorist activities? I wrote about this in 1996 in my book, Trends 2000, where I wrote that you're waking up in the new millennium and quote, Crusades 2000 is raging. And the reason I said for it happening was basically what we call Western imperialism. And it's forcing people into, here, I said the seeds of the new Crusades were sown in areas of Africa, the Middle East, Eastern Europe, and Asia, throughout the Muslim world, devout masses, politically repressed and impoverished, were rising, against, rising up against their endemically corrupt and inefficient secular governments with their pro-Western alliances. Imperialism, directly or indirectly, took the blame for the poverty, the lack of opportunity, and the social and moral decay. So you're it's saying that the developed nations are responsible for this world in, in, in spread of this uh, terrorism? Like I said, I said, disenfranchised, desperate, politically powerless, Muslims in many countries look toward charismatic clerics to change their destiny. And I wrote about it think? long before it happened. Oh, I see your point, but I think I'm also sort of concerned that you, you, know, you know what we're saying, terrorists aren't, are not responsible, it's only the Western nations? Isn't that sort of a well, not very balanced sort of idea? It, well, no, I, don't, I disagree totally, because if you look at the foundation of the United States and you read the words of our founding fathers, such as Madison and others, you know, they've made it very explicit, and Jefferson, the whole crew of them, to stay out of foreign entanglements. You, we have no business being anywhere. No country has any business being anywhere but within their country. So it's kind of like, you know, the old story, a policeman trying, uh, someone seeing a fight ha going on between a man and a woman and jumping in between them, and the man and the woman beat up the guy who jumped in between them. Well, the United States has no business. Now, of course, we've, we've looked at the, the scenario and the situation and the problems and the risks being created uh, on a daily basis. How can we stop this world from going into what appears to be now an um, inevitable disaster? I think that the people have to speak up and take a stand and say no more to war. And that we have our own problems to consider and no one else's. And that unless we're not, unless we are we are really have a threat of being attacked, we have no business fighting anyone else. Brilliant. Ms. Lenti, thank you very much for joining us. All the best with your future trend forecasting. Thank you very much. Mr. Malik, I mean, we've heard there that uh, Mr. Salenti has talked very strongly of Western imperialism. Um, what's your take on this? What are the root causes of terrorism? And, and I, I think that I would actually, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I fully disagree with Mr. Salenti, where he lays the blame for this entirely at the feet of the Western countries. Um, I, I think that, that there has to be some, some introspection. We have to look within ourselves and see, I mean, if in, 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 in a country like Saudi Arabia, where there's a, uh, you know, where you can be thrown into prison for years and years and years, mm -hmm and you're a citizen of Saudi, just because you maybe have, have disagreed with the, the, whatever the interpretation of, of, of the Wahhabi clergy is, uh, that is, we believe that that's fundamentally against the principles of Islam and as well as 
a leading cause or a, a huge cause of why terrorism why is it that you know imperialism is also in Africa? But why is it is it a coincidence that the the, the extremism and terrorism that we see is mostly coming from Muslim extremists? And 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 I am a Muslim and I'm proud to be a Muslim. But at the same time, I think we would be wrong if we don't look inwards and and see what's wrong with us. And that's where the voice of Hazrat Amirul Mu'minin comes in, and he has been guiding. And his message is so beautiful that his understanding of Islam and which is we get our understanding of Islam through him, that it resonates with people at the highest levels of government, whether it's the European Parliament, whether it's the US Congress, when after Hazur has, has visited these places, we get feedback from these leaders and say that this is the kind of Islam that, that we haven't seen before. So I think that at what Mr. Salenti is saying, I think that he also needs to be more balanced in his approach. And, and if, there is a, uh, if there is an extremist in Pakistan who has been raised to, to believe that he will go to heaven if he kills uh, an infidel or a Jew or a Christian, that is something that cannot be blamed on the West. That okay. has to be blamed on so there their to be flawed understanding of Islam. Okay, so I want to wrap up in the studio, but before we do, let's just go to Amjad Khan and just ask to what extent is this threat of terror taking us closer to World War III? It's a real threat. It's taking us closer to World War III. And as Khalifa al Masih, the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, has stressed, these are real concerns. There are real obligations that flow for both ways. Stronger and weaker nations have commensurate responsibilities. No nation is above the rule of law. And so we um, must understand and stress that global justice, the rule of law, trust, these are principles that must guide all the relations between nations, not just Western nations, not just Eastern nations. Everyone has roles and responsibilities that they must ad adhere to. Thank you very much, Amjad. Now, we are, we're coming back into the studio. Uh, Iftikhar, Mr. Yasab, to what extent, we've heard the Khalifa of Islam giving us some very, very clear guidance in terms of truth and democracy. We only have about a minute left on the show, but in terms of moving forwards, how can we combat terror through these principles before moving to Mr. Malik, sir? Well, actually, uh, terrorism is the worst that injustice can produce. And basically, the answer uh, to getting rid of terrorism is to getting on the path of justice. And I would say to the world, that uh, the uh, address of uh, His Holiness, the head of the Amity Muslim community on the 23rd of March, was a universal manifesto for the world to follow in order to achieve real justice and real peace and prosperity and harmony for mankind. This is very, very powerful. Mr. Malik, for yourself, how can we move forward in order to, in fact, pull ourselves back from World War III? What would your message be? I think that I would, I would agree with what Ayasab has said. I think that uh, we Muslims, non-Muslims, whatever your religion is, whatever your nationality is, whatever your ethnicity is, um, Islam lays down these fundamental principles that His Holiness has been um, expounding. And, and, and once we follow the principles of justice, once we follow the what's, you know, we would bear testimony against ourselves, that's something that Hazur said in his last address, I think that then we would we can be sure that we are willing to be introspective and make the right decisions and not just be swayed by interest groups or to the, the, the desire to get elected. I think that a lot of these things we have to, especially what we are faced with right now, I think we need to Here come together. Head on. Okay, this is perfect. Now, Farouk, that brings us to the end of the show. I think all we can do is thank our guests so very much. Time and flies by, doesn't it? It does, it does. <laughs> and there's so much we could talk about. We could apply this to every one of the global problems, God willing. Uh, also, thanks to Amjad for joining us again. And just also thanks to our viewers. Thank you very much for joining us. Join us next time for episode seven. I think the key message which we might be able to take away from this, I would say, Farouk, is that there are certain fundamental principles, justice, truth, honesty, kindness, compassion, which without these economic systems, international systems simply crumble. And it is those things which we must turn to. If I may add one other thing as well, which I think is important for our Saudi viewers, um, with Mr. Malik, we should also emphasize that we also respect and we, we think that with these principles, there can be great movements forwards and the reform movements in Saudi Arabia are, are to be respected. Islamic principles. Yes, so it's not to say Saudi as a whole is getting it wrong. So we're in this together, I guess, and is the key point. This was a 37 minute long speech of Azul. That's all, 37 minutes of a speech. 
to watch this speech. In that. That's all we can recommend. Thank you very much. May the peace and blessings of Almighty God be upon you. Thank and you. please join us next time on Episode 7. Salam alaikum. The has launched the campaign to try and counter the extremists. Now speaking out to denounce terror and extremism. 30,000 people formed a human chain in the South this afternoon in the name of peace. We're asking if religious intolerance is on the rise. We believe that religious freedom is a fundamental human right. Giving a message that Islam is a religion of peace. We must all endeavor to spread love and a sense of community.